Welcome to this special episode of the CEC Report. I'm Robert Barwick and my special guest today is Denise Braley of the Banking Finance Consumer Support Association. Welcome, Denise. Thank you. This is part two of a interview that we're doing, which we're calling Bank Crimes Are Worse Than Reported. Royal Commission Must Be Unleashed. Um, look up part one on YouTube if you haven't already seen it, where we talk about Denise's organisation, her advocacy of bank vic- for bank victims, um, the, a lot of the things that she detected in the banking system over time, and also the Royal Commission itself, because Denise is with us here in Melbourne, because she came over to attend the hearings of the Banking Royal Commission. Denise is one of the most qualified people in Australia on what the banks have been up to. So what I want to talk about to now, Denise, is um, the submission that you made to this Royal Commission, but before we get into the, the nitty gritty of it, I just make the same point I made in the last uh, episode. People have to understand how grave a risk the financial system is in Australia, because thanks to the government and the regulators allowing the banks to create a property bubble, create a bubble in the housing market, it was a deliberate decision um, starting in the early 2000s, and by giving them the green light, the way, the way these bubbles work, you've got to keep drawing suckers into them, right, yes. to keep expanding. And where Denise is an expert is the fact that the banks quickly ran out of people who could afford to borrow for properties and they had to find people who couldn't afford to but pretend they could. Mm-hmm. So knowing how that worked is important and that's what we're going to go through. But the consequences of that, that people have, the viewers have to understand, is that we have a... a um, property bubble that's super stretched. Everyone that's part of it, most of them can't afford what they're um, what they owe to the banks. They actually can't afford it. You put that figure actually at eighty yeah. percent of subprime things, interest only lending, etc., because they can't afford it. T- yes, today overnight, the U- United States Federal Reserve raised interest rates by a quarter of a percent. And even if our Reserve Bank doesn't raise rates. of our bank's borrowing comes from overseas. And those overseas interest rates are starting to rise. There will be a flow and effect of interest rate rise in Australia that Australian property consumers cannot afford. And what we're at risk is a a, a, um, rise in defaults like 2007 in America that can finally blow this up. And when it blows it up, it's gonna bring down the banks with it, right? And the whole Australian economy. So the CEC is pushing really hard for measures the government must implement to protect us from that, such as a Glass-Steagall separation of the banking system and other measures. And, you know, look us up on our website for for what we can do. Um, And we'll talk more at the end of the show. But that's just to set the scene for what we're going to talk about now, because you have to understand that that what Denise was going to go through, this is how it was made, and it really is based on a huge amount of fraud. Um, And it's, it's time some bankers went to jail, in fact you know, in this, which they don't tend to do in this modern era. So anyway, Denise, let's turn to you. Now, you've made, I've got to read through your submission, which I found very striking. Um, you really do go through the, the guts of, as you refer to it, the black box, the mechanics of how this fraud was constructed. Um, so let's go through some of the things that you are raising there. But you start off with an example of a case of a bank victim, and it just shows you Clearly, it's so transparent how the banks know that what they're doing is saddling someone with a loan they can't afford. So just just go through this case that you highlighted at the start of your submission. Well, it starts with a knock at the door. And a couple might come to the door and a broker is an agent of the bank. We need to understand that. And the bank then... Well, the, the banks always deny this, but the Royal Commissioner posed that question this week, didn't he? Yes, he he did. This is key. If he rules that the brokers are agents of the banks, this could unravel a lot. But you say they're agents of the banks. I agree. So, sorry, keep going. Well, the High Court has ruled that the broker is the agent of the bank. Okay. So it's a given that it will go that way. Good. But they come into the home and they sit down, have a cup of tea, and they try to explain, we can show you a better way that if you're on a pension that we can, or or a low income through super or whatever, we can show you a better way to manage your finances so that you use the equity in your home. Don't leave dead equity in the home is the key thing they use. This is all taught by the banks 
by the BDMs, the business development managers, who go out to the offices of the brokers, which we know have a high turnover of people, and constantly teach them this is the way for them to help their families make money. And in doing so, they get them to teach their parents first and practice on their parents. And, and suck a lot of parents into loans they shouldn't have. And then the siblings are pretty upset when they find the home yeah. is gone. Yeah. So the point is, the mortgage, let's give an example. The mortgage is for about 450000 The purchase price is really about four sixty. So they make an adjustment there of a mere $10,000. The purchase is the price of the investment property they Sorry, the to buy. Sorry, the Yes, yeah. you're going to use your home in order to buy an investment, investment property. property. Usually, what I call GI, in a geographically impossible place to get a drive-by. So usually it's a state away from where you live. Well, they had that story on um, Four Corners recently of the woman in, in the Sunshine Coast That's right. buying a property in Perth. That's right. That's how it works, and in Perth, it's somewhere in Queensland or New South Wales, <laughs> yeah. and Victoria in New South Wales. So the purchase price starts at 460. The loan approval comes through as 490, and that is not an overdraft, but it is a buffer, what they call the buffer loans. Mm -hmm. So you ask for 460, you get 490. The investment property is, in fact, unknown to the customer is only worth 340000 Nobody looks on Google to check this out because they're told that the developer is building these house and land packages and you've got to get in the market so that when it goes up, you're going to then have maybe twenty or 30000 profit for you. And does that make you suspicious that the banks are involved with those developers? Absolutely it does. Yes, the there's a lot of questions, yeah. really, the conflict of interest there between the developers and the banks. The valuer then warns the bank the purchase price is considerably higher than the valuation. That's in the valuation document, but will the bank show these people the, the true file that they've got, or will the bank show them the valuation? No, that's hidden from the customer. So the customer is left in the dark. The valuation suggests 400,000. Yet the bank fails to warn the consumer at all of the risks. They're saying this is good for you, they're from the bank, and the bank and the seller of the home work in tandem. Mm. So they've got two sellers they're paying commissions for. All right. Now the investment property is offered by the link developers. And the, then when I looked at the loan to value ratio, they're saying on the stand this week in the Royal Commission, loan to value ratios are normally about 60%. Right. That's if you just look at the combined asset of the cross collateralization of the two homes, the home you live in okay, and yeah. the investment property. Yeah. In reality, if you were just taking a true risk factor of what is the LVR on the Queensland property, for example, yeah. Uh, the investment property, it's around 141% average. And I've seen them as high as 180%. And as you said, Robbie, when the whole thing goes up uh, in terms of interest rates, that figure will be closer to 200% LVR. Someone needs to look at that because ASIC and APRA are not doing that. But the bank, which gets the foreclose on the investment property, also knows it's going to get the foreclose on the home. Their That's own right. Home. And when the foreclosure comes about, the couple that own their own home had no debt. They were the yeah. target ARIP market, which we've spoken about before. Uh, they end up with a $200,000 debt per person. This is disgraceful how this comes about. The age of the couple in target zone is normally coming to the end of their working life. So you can't really calculate what they're going to be earning for the next 30 mm. years. That, Without going into it, the legal ramifications for that is the bank must have regard in its lending obligations um, that uh, these, um, uh, these statistics have got to be proven to be correct in the first place or it should be stamped no loan, no approval of loan. Well, listen, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll go through with the things that banks do to paper over the fact that they've just saddled someone with a debt they yeah. can't afford. Yeah.
Welcome back to the CEC Report, where we're talking with Denise Braley of the Banking and Finance Consumer Support Association about her submission to the Banking Royal Commission. Um, and as I said, Denise is one of the a real experts in Australia and what the banks have done to defraud so many customers um, with, with mortgages. So Denise, before the break, you're telling this, this case of this older couple who've been saddled with a loan to buy an investment property and the loan is way above the worth of the investment property, but the property has been artificially valued higher and they don't know that, yeah. right? And the bank, they're, they're, they're towards the end of their working life, so they can't project 30 years of income ahead, right? They don't really know what income they're going to have. Oh. Um, and this loan is guaranteed to go bad. So what do the banks do then once it starts to... To, to, to unravel. Uh, to unravel and mm. to anticipate that and paper over it. Right. So people go to ASIC and they get a letter go and get a lawyer, or go to the Ombudsman Service. So I wrote a 14-page report on what should happen to the Ombudsman Service because every determination, the last 21, uh, uh, last 20 years in, in the Ombudsman Service says the broker is the agent of the borrower, which is false in law. Yeah. So the people get done again like a dinner, and then... But it's a protection for the banks to have that ruling. Absolutely. Yeah. So everyone is protecting in the system the banks, but no one is looking after the borrower. And the idea is to grab all these homes, and of course the banks can record them in terms of the monumental amount of assets they got at their disposal, because you've virtually given away your house yeah. to the bank, and you've collected another $200,000 debt while you're going along. And when the, so when the couple, they're not, I think you mentioned somewhere in the, um, your submission about how they're told, oh, you'll get a good in, uh, rental income from this. And of course, they yes, can't right. guarantee that. And it often doesn't work out that way at all, right? It's all overstated. So when there's no income from these investment properties, et cetera, and the couple can't service their loans, the banks come up with even more debt for them, don't they, to um, keep, them, right. keep them looking like they're servicing their loans? Yes. So the average uh, $450,000 loan suddenly starts to creep up. It can go up as high as 650000 within five years. So there's more debt on debt and there's lines of credit, there's buffer loans, there's what they call top-ups and there's overdrafts. Now in, in um, Australia, Denise, one of the things that's striking in the statistics is the delinquency rates on mortgages are always seen really low. When it gets close to 1%, they'll go, oh, it's, it's risen quite a bit. But you're thinking, well, 1% doesn't seem like very much. But those delinquency rates don't reflect what you've just described, where That's these right. people aren't counted as delinquent because the bank is throwing more money in. But eventually, it's going to, the chickens are going to come home to roost, That's right? That's right. And the most galling aspect is the people that are the target market have no debt, no credit yep. history yep. of uh, the adverse at all. So that they're being led into this vortex and then it's a quiet criminal um, yeah. activity because they've then got nowhere to go. They can't afford a lawyer. They've been lumbered and mired in debt. I think you say the financial ombudsman service tells them, go get a lawyer. But yes. They've already run out of money. They can't, there's no way they can That's afford right. a lawyer. Yes. All right. Well, look, a um, few other things. So uh, we mentioned this in the last episode, but I think it's worth repeating. You, you, you spent a bit of time talking about the sellers because... The brokers are the ones that get the bad rap in the reporting of this, right? right? It's like the, all these brokers are rogue and they're committing fraud and whatever. And people compare it to the movie The Big Short where there's a couple of rogue brokers in, in um, Florida. But your point is that they are the agents of the banks. And the Royal Commissioner mentioned that, the High Court mentioned that. That's a big deal, right? Mm. Um, but just say again, just quickly, how many these brokers that you've come across that are feel like they've just been spat up and used up and spat out by the system here? Mm. Well, the brokers themselves are devastated. But because they've come in via the licensing, uh, licensing system, I'm sorry, with ASIC, ASIC is there to threaten them that they can't go anywhere if they try and speak about this or they try and have an alternate view. Um, it's very, very difficult for the sellers to speak of this. I've been able to get their trust in over 50 to 100 sellers over the last 15 to 20 years and understand by looking at their own files of what they're doing and they've been extremely cooperative. And the giveaway though is there's a really high turnover among these sellers, these brokers. Yes, but what the key thing was that I learnt early on 
very early on from the sellers is the serviceability calculator. And the calculator is a bank program that the sellers all have a password to get into. Right. So when the, when the borrower sees that the broker has written or typed in, uh, you earn 200,000 a year and you think, well, hang on, I only earn 50. Uh, they're a bit upset and blame the broker. Broker, and yeah. that is why it's self perpetuating to blame the broker. So, ASIC foster that argument to blame the broker. It's not the broker, the bank managers are doing exactly the same things, same paperwork, same fraud is on the paper. But how do they then put a $220,000 income knowing it's false? Our lawyers say the banks have been over it with a fine tooth comb. The BDMs teach them yeah. it's a projection. We're allowed to use projections. Well, they're not. As a prudent banker, under Section 25.1 or Section 27 now of unaffordable lending in the, in the, the credit code the, and the banker's code, this is where they're breaking the law. So you've identified these serviceability calculators as a key part of the fraud here. Yes. Yes, it is. And it's the, the poor broker gets a bum rap, but it's the system that banks set up. Yes. That's, that's key. Um, tell us about the self-insuring of mortgages, because it, it, my understanding is the insurance that they sell to the, the borrower is, uh, you know, to, a part of it's to do with the residential mortgage-backed securities because it gives them a higher credit rating and, and things like that. Yep. Um, but the banks, that, the same banks that lend yep. the money insure, isn't that a huge conflict of interest? Well, it, it is even worse than that. In the early days, we used to see on the settlement statements coming through um, the risk fee, uh, sorry, the LMI, low mortgage insurance, and the amounts. And the amounts at that time were about four to five to eight thousand sometimes, depending on the loan. But I had a word with an ASIC commissioner, and we actually spoke to about two hours about this very subject. And in that conversation came out about the insurance because I had seen a pattern again emerge. That's what, I'm a criminologist, that's what I do. Yep. The pattern emerging was instead of the word LMI on the settlement statements, it showed risk fee and golly gosh, the price of that has gone between ten and $20,000. So that's what makes me believe there needs to be an investigation. Are the banks self-insuring? their own rubbish loans. Yep. Um, let's take another break, Denise. Welcome back to the CEC Report, where we're talking with Denise Braley of the Banking and Finance Consumer Support Association about the mortgage fraud in Australia that the Royal Commission is looking into. So, Denise, in the time we've got left, just before the break, you were telling us about the, as part of the black box of the mechanics of the fraud, you were telling us about the serviceability calculator. Tell us now about the loan application form, which you've identified as another part of the fraud. One key issue is that no borrower in Australia receives, at the point of signing, a copy of the loan application form. The loan application form, the written ones are about 11 pages, uh, so I'll deal with that but the online forms are just maybe one or two pages less. But the point is that the broker always fills in the form. No borrower in Australia is allowed to fill out their own form, none. What, do they sign it? Yes, they do. But what do they see when they sign it? They only see three pages. Only three pages are cleverly marked as needing a signature. <laughs> okay. The other eight pages, you do not need a signature form. So the brokers are taught by the BDMs or the sellers, the to, banks, the banks yeah. to go back to the uh, office and fill in all the financial details you've written on a pad. And then you put it into the service calculator. So it calculates all the, the algorithms of it, calculate phony tax benefits and advantages yeah. and those oh, okay, yeah. So the new figure is generated by the computer and the broker dutifully writes it on that form. And this is why, so I noticed in the Royal Commission this week, the Commissioner Kenneth Hain was, at, he was asking the ANZ guy, I think, a question and he, and he was at pains to, dis, to, to, um, to point out that the borrower is not the one committing fraud here, right? They're, That's right. They're being sincere. Yes. Right? 
Um, the fraud is obviously somewhere else, and this is in this the way this they only see three pages of an eleven page document. Yeah, it's in a cleverly engineered system, in order for the broker or seller not to find out what the fraud really is. So they're told their projections. Banks can't use rentals in that uh, arithmetic. Right. But they do. Of course they do. <laughs> and the broker doesn't pick up on that. He's just told to write on the form the projected rental. Remember, we haven't got a tenant yet. Yeah, yeah. Right? So again, so it's another a hypothetical projection. thing. Everything is hypothetical. Now, he then puts all of the 11 pages together with the identification documents, which only a bank officer can do. As Mr. Hayne pointed out, there is no face-to-face -face meeting with the banks, because right. the banks uh, suggested that that was the case. So therefore, the whole bundle of documents with all the identification and other necessary documents, your driver's license, and so forth, all sent into the bank processing centre for the robot the robo approval of the loans. That is the end of the seller's job. He's done his job. He's earned his commission at that point. He sourced the borrower. He filled out the forms for the borrower. He only showed them three pages. And we've got internal bank documents saying, do not show the borrower. Really? Absolutely. All banks <laughs> were doing the same thing, still are. And what possible risk would there be to show the borrower his own ap loan application well, form unless it's been changed? <laughs> they might change their mind. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's that's yeah. stunning. And, you, um, and as what you're talking about is the mechanics of how they've been able to commit fraud on an industrial scale. Yes. You know, you know there's tens of thousands, maybe into the hundreds of thousands of victims of this around mm. Australia. Oh, easily. Um, yes. And as you say, all... Uh, all loans use, you know, use things like the poverty index, etc. Just in the time we've got left, a couple of things. You've, you cite in your submission here cases of aged pensioners with lending facilities of $1 million to $4 million. Yes, that's not unusual. Pensioners are then taught through the Creating Wealth seminars to set up one house, then they'll approach them the next year to get another house. We've seen them anything from 14 to 24 properties. There is your bubble in the property yeah. market. And also, just the last thing, the question of superannuation, they're asked when they're selling up these older people, they ask them to put to own up to what super they've got, and you're yep. saying it's because they intend to get their hands on it. That's right. The banks will then hopefully uh, get all the super by the people that can't afford these loans, use it because they'll tell them to use their super to pay the payments, and that makes it look affordable. All right, so there you have it. Thanks again, Denise. To the, to the viewer, look, this is we have to... Um, Take this information and make it part of our campaign. There's two parts of the campaign. We've got to get this Royal Commission expanded in length. They need a lot more time to look at this a lot more thoroughly. And they need to look at the structures that allowed the banks to do this, right? Yeah. APRA doesn't care the banks commit fraud yeah. if they're profitable. That's how APRA operates. This system is structurally sick and has to change. Yeah. And so two things. Contact your Member of Parliament and demand they change the terms of reference for the Royal Commission, expand it, and also send a, an, an email to the Commissioner and say, look, the community's behind you, demand the government give, let you off the leash here so you can do your job. So thanks again, Denise, from the Banking and Finance Consumer Support Association. Appreciate you being here. Thanks to the viewer. We'll see you next week.